Look at the cross of Calvary. What do you see in the cross of Calvary? You see divine justice. God must punish sin. God is holy. He must punish sin. God is so holy that there is no hope for us. We cannot approach him. We cannot ever know him, walk with him, be with him eternally unless our sin is purged away by punishment. God must get rid of the guilt of sin by punishing it. So who can be saved? Who can be forgiven? How do you solve this problem? How can a holy God let off sinners? To just let them off will offend against his holiness and his justice as is God's character. He cannot do it. He cannot be unjust. He cannot overlook sin. So how can he save? By immeasurable love. God himself in the person of Christ comes down to take our place and our punishment for us so that God can be just and holy and loving and merciful. He does it himself and only he could do it. That's what you see on Calvary's cross. You see God's justice poured out. What pain for God. As one poet writes of God the Father veiling his face as he pours out his punishment upon his beloved Son. The love between the Father and the Son was vastly greater than we could conceivably imagine. Pure and perfect love. Yet despite that, because of pity and love for lost sinners, God punishes Christ on Calvary's cross. And Christ opens his arms, as it were, and cries out, punish me, instead of them. No wonder the Apostle Paul says, this is the only thing to glory in. On the cross of Christ, you see God's justice. On the cross of Christ, you see God's perfect wisdom. He solved the problem that I've been speaking of. The perfect wisdom of God, how to save lost men and women. On the cross of Christ, you see the purest offering because Christ had to be pure himself in order to be qualified to make an atonement for us. If he had been, perish the thought, a sinner in any way, he would have to bear his own eternal punishment. But you see, the Son of God, God and man, in all his holiness and purity, taking our sinful stain upon himself and bearing it away. The things you see on Calvary's cross, you see pardon accomplished and achieved. And then you see the qualities flowing from the cross of Calvary. You see the power of the cross of Calvary. It has tremendous power. If Christ died for somebody's sin, that person's justice has been cancelled, finished. God is satisfied. The person will never have that sin laid upon him. Christ has taken it. It's a powerful act. Christ died for millions of people, not for everyone but for millions of people who would be saved in the history of the world and forgiven 
who would come to him and repent and seek him and find him. And because he died, their punishment has gone. In the language of scripture, their sin is taken away. The remission, the taking away of sin. The power of the cross of Christ. There's nothing so powerful. An avalanche is nothing by comparison with the power of the cross of Christ and what it achieved in taking away lifetimes of sin for millions of people and bringing them to heavenly glory. You look at the cross of Christ and you see other things. Christ died for all kinds of people. What we call the universality of the cross of Christ. Are you rich? If you're moved to repent of your sin and to give your life to Christ, your sin was on that cross. Are you desperately poor and in need? Doesn't matter. If you're moved to repent of your sin and to give your life to Christ, your sin was just the same on Calvary's cross, taken away. Calvary achieved for all kinds of people, all nationalities, all age groups, intelligent and simple, rich and poor, no matter what. The achievement of Calvary is astonishing. Well, dear friends, our time is up and I must just take you to the end of the verse. The apostle says, God forbid that I of all people should glory and esteem anything higher than this. I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Says the apostle, when God worked in my heart, a proud Pharisee, very ambitious, seeking a high position in the Jewish church and the Jewish nation, persecuting Christians, bigoted and full of my ideas. When God humbled me, and brought me to see Christ and what happened on Calvary's cross. Something else happened. I died to this world. That's what he says. By whom the world is crucified unto me. The world died in my estimation. I saw through it. I saw that it was a materialistic, rationalistic world, all for the here and now. I saw its deceptions, its false promises to make me happy, to make me special, to make me rich when it couldn't fulfill these promises of making me happy. I saw that the world was full of corruption and violence and deceit. I saw that it was a great sham, that the royals are no better than their subjects. The world died, as far as I was concerned. Friends, if you come sincerely, and you repent of your sin, and you give your life to God, and you trust in Christ alone, and what he's done, done on Calvary, you will have a river of evidence flowing through your life and you will have joy and peace and deep inner happiness and you will have moral strength, a new nature, a new character. All these things will come to you because you saw what Christ achieved on Calvary and you bowed the knee and came to him.